So, the Pixel 6 Pro. After more than two months with this device now, using it as my daily driver, I have to say, I'm kind of over it. Let me explain. to admit that I've been a huge fan of Pixel devices for the past couple years now, despite their flaws and obvious shortcomings, but devices like the Pixel 3, Pixel 4, and the Pixel 5 have been my secondary devices anytime that I review a new smartphone whenever they come out. Generally, I do like the styling of the phones, even if they've been a little bit bland, but the software experience that they offer is second to none. But what's really kept me hooked on Google's Pixel smartphones over the last couple years has mainly been the cameras on the back of their phones. So when the Pixel 6 and the 6 Pro were finally announced a couple months back, I was really excited, like many of you were, that Google was finally putting in the extra effort to take on high-end Android devices from the competition. They designed their own custom chipset on the inside here, delivered exceptional imaging hardware on the back of the phone, bumped up the screen size and the refresh rate, and a whole lot more. The list goes on and on. And then there's that cherry on top which is a $900 price tag, which when compared to the competition makes the Pixel 6 Pro even more compelling. Since honestly, this phone can go up against devices like the Galaxy S21 Ultra, which cost $300 more. So what do you actually get when you pay $900 for the Pixel 6 Pro? Well, the first thing you're gonna notice is how big this device actually is. And that's mainly because of the 6.71 inch LTPO OLED display on the front with 120 hertz dynamic refresh rate and a resolution of 1440 by 3120. And then there is a steel frame all the way around, except for the top part that has a cutout for millimeter wave radio bands up there. But the heftiness of this device is due to that steel frame versus aluminum and then a glass back panel and a 5,003 milliamp hour battery. Of course, there's stereo speakers like always, and then IP68 dust and water resistance. And on top of that though, Google's actually designed their own chipset, their new Tensor chipset that's powering this device with 12 gigabytes of RAM, which is another first for a Google device and then all the way up to a half a terabyte of storage if the standard 128 or even the 256 isn't good enough for you. And of course, there's that massive camera visor on the back of the phone that stretches edge to edge. And it's honestly not for show. Google's crammed in a new 50 megapixel main sensor, 48 megapixel 4X periscope camera, and then a 12 megapixel ultra wide as well. And then peeking through the display up front, if you can see it, is an 11.1 megapixel selfie camera, which is a great upgrade over the standard eight megapixel Google's been using for a couple of years now. So as you can see, the hardware on this device front and back is really impressive. But of course, the standout feature on the Pixel 6 comes down to its imaging capabilities. And that's been the case on Pixel devices for the past couple of years now. The upgraded hardware has been a long time coming and the use of that larger sensor for the rear camera is quite noticeable, mainly with the added depth of field that it delivers with that 50 megapixel sensor. The images this phone is capable of capturing are absolutely incredible, giving you that same computational photography results that we've come to love with previous Pixel devices, exposing details in the shadows that you typically wouldn't be able to see without blowing out the highlights in the skies or other light sources that might be in your shot. It's even better in low light situations as well, capturing inc an incredible amount of light and delivering some truly stunning images. The 12 megapixel ultra wide camera on the other hand is a little bit of a letdown featuring a 114 degree field of view which isn't quite as wide as previous smartphones from Google and the competition as well, delivering less dramatic shots than what you would typically want from an ultra wide. And then there's the 48 megapixel 4X periscope zoom camera, which I have to say is definitely a lot of fun to use. It doesn't come close to the zoom abilities of the Galaxy S21 Ultra, but 4X is still a great focal length. And you can also zoom in a little bit closer if you want with digital zoom, taking things up to six or even eight X without losing much of the quality. And I have to say the images here are really, really sharp. All that being said, I came into this expecting a little bit more from Google. After using that same old camera hardware for so long, I really wanted the Pixel 6 Pro to deliver 
a massive improvement over its predecessors, and it honestly really doesn't. Sure, there's the zoom camera that gives you this unique experience, and then that main camera sensor that adds a little bit more depth of field when you get in really close to your subjects, but and honestly, in most situations, you're really gonna have a hard time telling the difference between pictures captured with the Pixel 6 and last year's Pixel 5, or even the Pixel 5a, which honestly, at this point, is selling for just $400. The good news, though, is that this hardware also delivers a significant improvement when it comes to video capture, which is something Google's been lagging behind for the longest time. Thanks to the new Tensor chipset, Google is now able to use similar computational photography algorithms as it does with its photos now on videos at 60 frames per second, all the way up to 4K resolution, delivering sharper frames and much better dynamic range, color reproduction, and smoothness for those video clips. It's honestly a night and day difference when comparing this to previous generation Pixel devices. Well, I do have to say, the improvements over previous Pixel devices over the years that we've seen from Google is phenomenal. It's still not on par with what we've seen from Apple with the iPhone 13 Pro. You really can't compete with that. But really, if you're looking for a great device on the Android side for capturing videos, this selfie camera and also the main camera on the back of the phone are absolutely phenomenal. And then finally, there's that 11.1 megapixel new camera sensor on the front of this device, which finally delivers 4K video capture, something that we thought would never be coming to a Pixel smartphone. It's only 30 FPS, but that's definitely a huge improvement over 1080p. And the good thing is here, selfies are even better than they were before. And that's saying a lot because the Pixel devices have been regarded as one of the best smartphones for taking selfies for the past couple years with their traditional eight megapixel sensor that they've been using for so long. So bumping things up to 11.1 megapixel and improving the image quality on top of that should definitely make this one of the best smartphones on the market for capturing selfies. But a smartphone, is more than just a camera. And the Pixel 6 Pro, when you look at everything else, does have its fair share of flaws. Since the launch of this device, it suffered issues with its in-display fingerprint sensor being extremely slow or even unresponsive for many users. Now, I do have to say that for me, I never experienced any issues with the fingerprint sensor on this device, but the issue got so bad with so many people that Google had to release a blog post to talk about why it was so slow in the first place and then follow up with a software update later on to improve the responsiveness of the fingerprint sensor itself to make it just a little bit better for those who were having issues in the first place. And then there's the charging speed fiasco that you might have heard about. Like many new devices these days, the Pixel 6 Pro doesn't come with a charging brick inside the box, but Google did recommend picking up its 30 watt fast charger when buying this phone without actually stating that the Pixel 6 Pro maxes out at 22 watt charging, which means the 5,003 milliamp hour battery takes a full 111 minutes to charge from zero to 100%. To make things worse, the phone charges even slower when using a non-power delivery charging brick, and in some cases doesn't charge at all when using longer USB-C cables or chargers with proprietary systems that come from Xiaomi or even Oppo. While not necessarily a flaw, the battery life isn't quite as good as what you'd expect from a smartphone with a battery that's this size. Most days you'll be able to make it through a long day with without even breaking a sweat, but you can forget about being able to go and use this phone for a day and a half on a single charge. I'll usually plug in the phone at night with roughly 10 to 15% battery life remaining after having it off the charger for 15 hours or so. I'd definitely say it's adequate, but definitely not spectacular. I have a feeling though that battery life could get better with future improvements and optimizations to the Tensor chipset with a couple future updates, but I'm not gonna be holding my breath and are ever expecting this thing to last a day and a half. The 6.7 inch OLED display sports all the bells and whistles with its adaptive 120 hertz refresh rate, HDR support, 24 bit color depth, and incredible viewing angles as well. And honestly, it can be used in direct sunlight without any issues. Though personally, the one thing I would have changed is adding a flat display versus the curved one since a flat one is easier to use for typing and doesn't add unnecessary glare when you're using it in landscape for gaming or watching videos. 
When it comes to performance, the five nanometer Google Tensor chipset is a little bit of a mixed bag. If you're simply running benchmarks, it's definitely not as powerful as the Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 that's used in most other flagship phones this year. But the performance differences are really hard to notice in day-to-day -day use. Being that this is Google's first custom chip, it's actually pretty impressive, especially since the main reason that they went with their own silicon was to deliver better performance in imaging tasks and artificial intelligence, more than anything else. But I will have to say, having 12 gigabytes of RAM is a huge step up for a Pixel smartphone. Not having to worry about apps being bumped from memory on a regular basis is quite nice, matching what Samsung, OnePlus, Xiaomi, and other brands have been doing for the last couple of years now. But of course, the Pixel 6 Pro and also the Pixel 6 are also the introduction platform for Android 12 and the new Material U aesthetic. I have to say that the new look and feel for Android was definitely needed. Google put in a lot of work to make sure it was as cohesive as possible with widgets and icon colors that change automatically based off of your wallpaper colors, making the software truly feel like it can adapt to your personal style rather than forcing its look on you. There's still some work to be done around the edges, but I'm definitely enjoying the new look, especially since there have been so many widgets updated on Android from Google itself and other app makers as well, more than we've ever seen over the past couple years. I have to say, I'm definitely a sucker for a great looking widget. As you can see, the Pixel 6 Pro has its fair share of ups and downs. It's a really good device when you compare it to the Galaxy S21 Ultra offering incredible value on that end. And it has really good camera capabilities as well when you compare it to previous Pixel devices. But after using this for more than two months now, I have to say I'm just over the hype. And that's not because there's something that's dramatically better that's out there. In fact, the reason I'm over the Pro is because of this phone right here, the Pixel 6. It may not have all the bells and whistles as the Pro, but I think it's definitely a better device that everybody should be buying right now. But if you want more on that, make sure you subscribe to my channel for my upcoming Pixel 6 review. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.